This is Things I Need to Learn in Life I Didn't Learn in School. Covering everything we should know as adults that got glossed over in our classrooms. With your host, Wave News anchor, Don G. I appreciate everyone joining us for things I need to learn in life I didn't learn in school. This one important to every mom and dad. I want to welcome Dr. Crystal Narcisse, who is joining us today. And we are talking about mental health, Dr. Narcisse, but, but for our little ones, for our children, our young people, um, talk about your line of medicine. Yes, I practice internal medicine and pediatrics, and I work for Norton Healthcare. So kids are back in school, some kids getting ready to go back in school. I feel like life is just different after the pandemic, and I think I can say that with some surety. Uh, would you say that? Absolutely. There are so many things going on. The pandemic, uh, the economy, um, civil unrest in terms of um, gun violence. There's so many things that are going on, uh, gas prices. And we think um, a lot of times that these things will affect adults, but it actually affects little kids as well. So it's important to um, acknowledge that there are going to be signs and symptoms that you should look for in your children. Sometimes they may not be able to fall asleep or they may want to withdraw and not be um, enjoying life no the way that they normally do. Like they may not be playing like they normally do or they may not be interacting with the family. So it's important to recognize those signs and symptoms. Sometimes I feel like parents have the weight of the world on their shoulder, but they look at their kids and say, those are kids. There's no way they feel what I'm feeling. But for that little body and that little mind, it's as important what they're going through as what we are going through. Is that right? That's absolutely true. And it's always important to um, look at the parents first because um, there's a phrase that I, I love, you know, when you're about to go into a, uh, an airplane, um, they say, first put on your own oxygen mask before you help someone else. So it's important that if you have anxiety, that you should have that address so that you can actually help your child. So if you have that going on, um, it's important to address that first. But with little kids, um, sometimes it might actually affect um, their diet or their appetite or um, ability to fall asleep. So are those the, well, give us just like a, a and, and I know every child is different, so there's no way to say this is going to happen, then this is going to happen. The top things that we need to look at would be what? Um, irritability, so um, finding that um, your child may be uh, um, upset easily, um, um, watching out for uh, appetite, um, sleeping, um, being withdrawn, um, not being able to focus. That's probably the number one thing I see, that kids have an issue focusing if they're anxious or even if they um, have low mood. Uh, I have always heard that it's best to ask open-ended Questions. Sure. If you ask a yo yes or no question, they're going to say yes, they're going to say no, and that is the end of the conversation. What's the best way to go around doing that? Sure. If something happens like um, that you can see like on the news, um, for example, um, there's been a lot of things going on with gun violence in the Uvalde shooting, um, you can ask your child, you know, how, how was your day today? Um, I heard that there was something that had happened you know, in the news. Do you know anything about it? Um, or you could ask something like, um, what's the best thing that happened to you today? Or what's the worst thing that happened to you today? And that way, they don't feel pressured into you know, speaking about something um, specifically. But they can just kind of um, answer in their own way. You know, it's funny. When my grandson was young, and I'm all about you know, talking, drove my kids crazy, I know. And I just kind of started peppering him with questions. And I, I don't know, I guess maybe it was just too many. And he finally looked at me and said, Grandma, do we always have to talk? <laughs> and I didn't know what to do after that. I'm just like, where do I go now? What do I do? Like when you see maybe they're getting perturbed with you, do you, do, you, do you pull back or is that a sign you need to go deeper? 
I would give them some space. And it depends on the child, you yes. know, for, especially if it's a talkative child, maybe, maybe they, they want you to probe. But if it's a, a child that's usually, you know, kind of laid back, I would just give them a few minutes, um, you know, and then come back and re readdress the, the topic a little bit later. Yeah, he's a very quiet child. Yeah. He was just like, I'm not having any of this. Well, you, you brought up a point like talking to them about well, I, I, I can't exactly remember the question, but we have this conversation in the newsroom where one of our reporters said, I heard you should never mention specifics about violence or something that happens because it's bad for the child, that you shouldn't let them know that a shooter can come in their school, or you shouldn't really say that these things can happen. But in my mind, I can remember when my kids were young and I told them sometimes bad people do bad things. Right. If you hear something, say something. Right. If you're afraid, bring it up. If you see someone with a gun, immediately leave that area. Right. But the other person was saying, no, no, you'll, you'll totally freak your kids out. Don't do that. So we, I mean, this conversation went on for, forever and now I'm confused. Well, I think it depends on the child, too. Um, for some parents, like for me, um, I do bring things up to my children. I have a four-year-old and a six-year-old. So I kind of like um, will ask them what they know. And if they know something, especially if I see it troubles them, I do like to talk to them about it. Um, and I know this sounds you know, probably a little silly, but I love Sesame Street. And I just love the way that they bring up topics. So we might actually watch something like, um, depending on the topic. So COVID was a good one that they have a lot of videos on. Um, and they have a great way to bring up certain topics in a way that's not too pressured or not doesn't make them too scared. So it, like I said, it depends on the child and it depends on your own parenting style as well. So let's go over some specific topics. You just brought out COVID. Mm -hmm. um, this is hard for adults. Right. People want to ma wear masks, they don't want to wear masks. They want to get a vaccine, they don't want to get a vaccine. Uh, people are arguing, you know, over it. What do you do with your children? What do they need to know if there are any specifics at all? I'm anxious about it. I can only imagine children are anxious about it. They're getting ready to go back to school. We're in the red. You have your mask on. Yes. Um, and children will be going back to JCPS with a mask on. Where, how do we unwrap all that mess? Well, I guess I'm a little slighted because I'm a really, I'm really pro mask. But I will say that um, in terms of um, kids going back to school, a couple of things. One is, you know, the the rules are we have to wear a mask, and it's just to keep, you know, me safe, your kids safe, um, and also family members that live at home. Um, the other thing is, um, I am also pro vaccine, so I do believe in, you know, kids should, you know, get their vaccines, uh, spe specifically the COVID vaccine, because it helps prevent severe illness. But also um, having a routine. Kids need and love routine. So, you know, um, taking your kids uh, shopping so that they can get their book bags and their uh, school supplies and having them be, uh, you know, invested in um, getting things ready. Also talking about the first day of school, especially kids, um, uh, little ones. So my, my daughter, she's four and she's going to be starting pre-K. So I've been talking to her about, OK, this is the first day of school is going to be coming up. This is who your teacher is going to be. And um, it helps um, to calm her fears because a lot of times, even for me, the fear of, uh, of the unknown makes me a little nervous. So now that I'm talking to her about what to expect, it really has helped her. So she's really excited to start um, pre-K um, in about two weeks. So having a routine. Um, so I think that you know doing those things helps to calm their fears. And each child is different. Yes. My daughter going to kindergarten, saw me get out of the car and she's like, hey, 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 where are you going? This is not where you go. This is for me. This right. is not for you. And I was like, I have to go in and talk to her. She was like, I got this. And I was like, no, I'm going in. And for my boys, both of my boys, they literally grabbed, held, you know, held my leg and I had to drag myself out. So you have to be aware, uh, I guess, of, of the child. Um, should we talk about everything to children? We talked about, again, it depends on the child. Like, uh, we're going through an economic tough time now. Should they know how tough, you know, it is at home or? Um, 
I wouldn't want to worry your, the child um, excessively, but I think that they should know at least a little bit. But I think um, kids like to be, feel safe. So even I would say something like, even though you know there's a lot of things going on in the world in terms of the economy or uh, racism or things like that, you live in a safe environment. I'm going to keep you safe. And I want you to know that we will make sure that you have something to eat and a place to live and things like that so that they feel comfortable and safe. And they don't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from, just to reassure your child. We're kind of just shoving everything in the bag right now because I don't, you know, I won't have a lot of time with you. Uh, bullying seems to be a really big deal. Um, I'm sure there's always been bullying, but now we have social media. So you get to be bullied 24 hours a day by people you don't even know. And I have heard parents say, oh, she'll get over it, you know, because I, you know, I was bullied as a child. I personally, and this is my own personal opinion, feel like it's different now. Yeah. And I wonder as a parent, what should we do? It's good to actually start the conversation. And I, I don't think it's a good idea to just say, are you being bullied? Because some kids will kind of clam down and not want to talk. But just say, you know, how was your day today? And just having that routine of just asking your child, how, how are you doing today? And let them kind of guide the conversation. Um, another way um, you can even bring it up is if you have an inkling that there's something going on, you can actually give your own story of saying, you know, when I was in first grade, um, there was a kid who used to do X to me, and this is how I felt, and this is what I did. So that way um, your child can kind of identify with um, some of the feelings that you had as well. And then um, you could ask more, you know, directed questions and say, well, you know, I've been hearing a lot of um, bullying has been going on at, you know, such and such a person's school. And, you know, that made my, my friend's son feel really, really bad. I wonder, have, have you ever seen anyone being bullied before? Tell me about that. What did you do? What did the school do? And it kind of gives you like kind of an edge into asking the questions. And uh, you may not want to comment about this, but watching my, uh, my family, just a slew of educators, but watching what goes on, sometimes I hear about things or see things, and parents, when their child is bullied, they come into the school acting just like crazy. And I, we had a story on the news, actually, where... Um, the mother took the kid out to fight the other kid because you're yeah. not going to let that kid bully you. You go out here and whoop their tail. N no. No. I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> That's like, no. So we as adults have to think about what we're doing exactly. when it comes to examples for our kids. Exactly. Modeling good behavior. Um, there's a book that, I don't know, it's a little bit off topic, but it's a book that I read with my four-year-old. It, it says, um, one, two, three, I'm as calm as can be, is calm down time. So what I try to do is when my daughter gets upset, I just say, let's take a deep breath and count to three to calm down. And sometimes even when I'm seeing patients that they say something really, you know, that is upsetting, I just take some breaths and calm down. And I, I say all that to say that it's good to model that to your child so that when my daughter gets upset, she remembers, oh, I need to take a breath. So instead of trying to engage if someone is trying to fight you, you just take a step back, step away, take a breath, and de-escalate the situation. Because nowadays, you know, when I was a kid, I didn't have to worry about someone bringing a gun to school. But now, you know, you just don't know. So you want to do as best as you can to de-escalate the situation and not engage. I think all of us could learn, probably learn a little of that. My daughter does a smell your soup. Oh. They get upset and she says, wait a minute, you need to stop and smell your favorite soup. And they go <sighs> like that and take a deep breath. I love that. Uh -huh. So she goes, oh, everybody stop, smell your favorite soup. And, and you, can, you can just try to uh, see them calm down. Life is different certainly than when older people were young. Uh, is there anything in particular that is so different that maybe we don't see it as parents? Is, are there anything else, any situations, any topics that come to mind that we haven't covered yet? 
I think the power of social media, um, that's very, very uh, pervasive right now. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I know this dates me, we didn't really have cell phones and Facebook and things like that. And you had mentioned about being bullied that, you know, when, when I was younger, they used to pass notes to other people. Now it's, there can be a whole slew of things that's being said about you online that you're not even aware of. So it's good to actually have that conversation with your kids um, and find out, you know, how much time are you spending on social media? You know, um, also being able to take their cell phones away, um, you know, at, at night, because a lot of kids that I see, they're up one, two or three o'clock in the morning on their cell phones. So it's good to actually, you know, take it away, put it away and let make sure that your kid gets enough sleep. So social media is a, is a big thing, like I said. Yeah, you may not want to answer this question. Okay. And if you don't, just say, I'm not getting into that. Mm -hmm. But I remember uh, when my oldest kids were little, it wasn't no such thing as no cell phone, none right. of that. But when I had my youngest child, I guess he was about 10 years old, and he was like, all my friends have a cell phone. I want, oh, you're 10 years old. You don't go nowhere without me. Right. Or without your grandma or granddad. So what you need a cell phone for? It became a huge battle. Absolutely. And I told him once he became a teen, maybe, we would think about a cell phone. Right. But it was a few years fight where I can't believe you're making me look bad. I don't have a, I'm not nobody else's mama but yours. Right. I don't care what everybody else is. But it was... It was a battle and he felt slighted because I would not let him have a cell phone. Do do you have an age where, or, or even cues to say, if your child can do this, this, and this, they can have a cell phone? How do we know when they're ready for all that? I think that's a good question. I don't know if I have a great answer. I just know for my son, he's, he's six. So um, I would feel most comfortable if he had a cell phone, if he is more responsible. So if, you know, there's sometimes he has toys that he doesn't know where they are. Cell phones are expensive. So I feel like he'll get one when, when I know that, you know, he can keep it and he's not going to lose it. So I think that's probably like a, just a general rule of thumb. And it really depends on, you know, your parenting style as well. But again, the world is so different. And it this is. just literally popped in my head. It is. The world is so different that if I'm not with him, at least he could call me. That's there true. were children in the Uvalde school sh shooting yes. who were calling police to tell the police what was going on. So now right. I just confused myself. <laughs> you right. know, I just confused myself because I'm, I'm thinking it would, it, it's, I guess good sometimes to have that cell phone. It is. I mean, that's definitely some pros and cons that, you know, giving young kids cell phones. So, yes. Yeah. Life is, is confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, tips about violence, any at all. I mean, I don't understand, you know, what's going on with all of that. I did not fight. I did not have fights. Are those things that we should talk to our kids about? If somebody comes up to you and approaches you this way, what do we have those conversations? Because like you said, in our day, nobody's bringing a gun to school. Right, right, you might right. hit somebody and then you, the, you get hit back and that's the end of the story. Yeah, yeah. I think um, the first thing I would say is, you know, um, with gun violence, uh, the number one cause of death for kids between the age of one and 19, it used to be motor vehicle accidents. And now over the last, I think, believe two years, it's actually more um, gun-related injuries. So it's really climbing right now. Um, I think number one is if you have a gun at home, make sure that it's locked and that it's not accessible to your child. Um, we would lo I would love to say that, you know, parents think about that, but, you know, not everybody does. So make sure you have a gun lock and it's put away. Number two is if you have a gun and you haven't talked to your kid about, you know, uh, not touching it, you should tell them, don't touch it. But like I said, not make it accessible. Um, the other thing is, with the pandemic, um, a lot more kids have been displaying symptoms of anxiety and depression. So if you notice any symptoms of your kid, of your child, that you should actually try to address it. You can talk to your child about it or seek um, counsel or counseling with a school counselor or a therapist. Because a lot of times uh, when uh, people act out, it's because they have some uh, uh, issues that they're dealing with. So I think trying to prevent that from happening is another thing. And I know a, a hot debate right now is, you know, uh, trying to have legislation where we don't have assault rifles because the thing is, when you have um, uh, more uh, bullets available with an assault rifle, you do more damage. So I know that's a, probably a hot topic too. 
Um, but those are the things that I would suggest. And as we kind of start to wrap this up, you talk to different age children in different ways, mm -hmm. I would guess. Yes. All right. Anything else that you can think of that I didn't bring out that you want to say, hey, please think of this as well? Yes. Two things. I'm a big advocate for sleep. Children do not get enough sleep. Adults don't get enough so sleep. That's true. That's that's absolutely true. So for little ones, probably up until you know teenage years, they need about 10 to 11 hours of sleep. And when you're about a teenager, you need about nine to nine and a half hours of sleep. Most of the kids I see maybe get six or seven. And when you don't get enough sleep, you actually can exhibit signs of ADHD, not being able to focus, not being able to complete your task. It's so important that kids get sleep. And the other thing is nutrition. I would not send my kid to, to school without getting something to eat. So if you're, if you're hungry, you're not gonna be able to pay attention as well. So those are like two big things for me, getting enough sleep, and also nutrition. And if I can add one more thing about sleep is that our brains actually commit things to memory when we're sleeping. So one of the things I will ask some of my adult um, patients is if they're not able to remember, I'll ask how much sleep did you get? Um, the other thing is your body actually fights infection more so when you're sleeping. Um, so, um, so, or I should say when, it, when it's at rest. So like I said, sleep is very important and making sure you get good nutrition as well. So the good nutrition thing yes. uh, is deep in my heart. Mm -hmm. I have a nonprofit, a recipe to end hunger. We raise funds to make sure that especially children and families get to eat. There are large families, a large number of families that are food insecure. Right. A lot of times people are embarrassed about that. Right. If a family is facing the problem of not being able to have enough food that would make them healthy and give them a good life, sometimes they don't want to reach out and ask for help. I don't even know what the question is there. All I can tell you is that my heart is breaking when I think of them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I know that uh, different doctors have different resources, but one place you can ask is actually your doctor. So some of um, the Norton clinics will actually have like, you know, some food resources, but also we have ways to, you know, connect um, families with resources. There's one other um, website that I love. It's called louisconnect.com, where you type that in and actually it can connect you with resources for housing, um, for food, um, legal advice, and it's all for free. And if you have your GPS on, it'll tell you which resource is actually closest to where your location is. So, like I said, you can you know, express that to your doctor, and your doctor can actually hook you up with some resources. And most schools now have oh, family resource centers absolutely. where their job is to make sure that your family is able to function. Absolutely. All right, did we forget anything? I think we covered a lot of stuff. <laughs> we did. We covered a lot. And um, with so much going on and, and kids getting ready to go back to school, I guess the main thing is I think we're getting better, but mental health has just, it's like, shh, people don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And now we're opening up and doing better. Yes, uh, I believe so. To talk about that. It's okay to say, I'm anxious. I'm sad, I'm mad, and I've always heard that feelings are not wrong, they just are. That's correct. So it's okay to feel however you feel. Sure, um, and so I think it is, I, I know um, growing up it would say that boys are not supposed to cry or what are you crying about or things like that, but it's important to let your child express themselves and you can actually kind of direct them and say, you know, it's okay to be upset, but you don't have to scream, you know. It's okay to be upset and you can, you know, take some deep breaths and calm down. So you can kind of guide your child into, you know, expressing themselves as well. All right, I, I appreciate all this as we try to make sure that our children are always doing well and they're happy and they are adjusted. Again, Dr. Crystal Narcisse from Norton Healthcare Institute for Health Equity. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This was great. Well, again, they always say there's not a, a book to help you be a good parent, but just do the best you can and know that it is important. Things I need to learn in life, I didn't learn in school and today, it was mental health for our children. 
I'll see you next week. And as always, thanks for listening.